The glass key was the back end of a one-two punch from Paramount Pictures in 1942. In combination with this gun for hire, it set the table for the arrival of the film noir movement, which fully ignited with the release of Double Indemnity in 1944, also from Paramount. Alan Ladd emerged from these two films as a sleek and stoic leading man, but he sure took his share of lumps on the way to stardom. The beating he takes from William Bendix in this film was shocking for the time, especially the weirdly homoerotic glee Bendix's character takes in doling out the punishment. The story goes that for the sake of authenticity, Ladd told Bendix not to hold back, and as a result, one of those right crosses knocked Ladd out cold. No hard feelings, though. Ladd and Bendix became best friends in real life. They even bought houses across the street from each other. Now, Bendix wasn't the only one in the cast who packed a punch. Although she was barely five feet tall, Veronica Lake could dish it out pretty good herself. After she overheard Brian Donlevy make disparaging comments about her on the set, Lake took full advantage of a legitimate chance for revenge. When Janet Henry smacks Paul Madvig in the kisser, Lake let loose with everything she had. Purportedly, Don Levy refused to do a second take. Now, this was still very early in Veronica Lake's career, but she already was burning bridges and her leading men at an alarming rate. Joel McRae, who'd co-starred with her the previous year in Sullivan's Travels, refused to work with her again saying, life is too short to make two pictures with Veronica Lake. Lake despised Frederick March, her co-star in I Married a Witch, made the same year as The Glass Key, also at Paramount. Clearly, Brian Donlevy was no fan. Fortunately, she achieved detente with Alan Ladd, enough for Paramount to pair them seven times, four times playing fictional characters and three times as themselves. Last year, Veronica Lake's autobiography was republished, and I was honored to write the foreword. She wrote it in the early 1970s, mainly to answer rumors that had dogged her for years about schizophrenia, drug abuse, and alcoholism. I don't know about the mental illness, but she certainly doesn't deny the drugs and booze. What's most compelling about her story is how she felt trapped by her fame and celebrity, and the desperate measures she took to escape. Lake died not long after completing her memoir at only 50 years of age. And while many people looked at her life as a tragedy, she told her tale without a trace of self-pity and with an abundance of the sardonic wit that was often an overlooked aspect of her screen persona. It's a good read that I highly recommend. As for Dashiell Hammett, by 1942, his writing career was tapped out. Instead, he invested himself as an editor in the career of his lover, playwright Lillian Hellman, a relationship that's been fictionalized on film a few times. He also served five months in prison in 1951 for contempt of Congress after refusing to give up the names of suspected communists. Amazingly, Red Harvest remains his only novel never turned into a movie, at least officially. Its plot has been appropriated many times, from Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo to Walter Hill's Last Man Standing to the Coen Brothers' Miller's Crossing. Share your thoughts about The Glass Key on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed, and then join me next week when I return to my official Noir Alley lair, at least temporarily, to present a proto-feminist version of Rear Window, Witness to Murder, starring Barbara Stanwyck. You do not say no to Barbara Stanwyck under any circumstances. So I know I'll see you here in seven days. <laughs>